Welcome back to the French Rugby Podcast with me, Tim Groves, former Scotland international and adopted Frenchman, Johnny BT, but no Benjamin Kayser. <laughs> you saw him at the weekend, Johnny. So was it too much red wine? Did, was it something you said? What's happened? Uh, it was fairly abstemious until he got a significant text message from a former friend. Um, and I've never seen a man's eyes light up from a text message from another man, the way Benji Kayser's eyes lit up when he got a message from Ronnie Roncero. Uh, exactly, dangerous. Um, so no, look, it, it, was, it was great. It was great to be up there. It was great to catch up with Benji in person, which was the first time in forever, since probably since we played against each other, because we haven't seen each other at all since we started this. So it was really cool. It was also very cool to see how he operates as a pundit, the coolest man in the world, coolest cucumber, just rocks up, natural, all flows out, uh, very effortless compared to me, which is very robotic and <laughs> trying my ass off. Um, but great to see him. We even managed to do a bit of prep together before the game, watch the game together, which was very cool. Um, and we had a few jars afterwards. But I had to get the plane the next morning over to Murrayfield. So it was a little, I was slightly abstemious um, and quite chilled. And I maybe left him about one in the morning when he got that message. And honestly, you've never seen a man's eyes, ears, everything prick up. Just the smile that came across his face. You're saying, come on, we're going to this place called Creamers or something in the middle of Paris. And I'm like, mate, it sounds like a total dive. But he went off to meet um, Ronnie Roncero there. I think he ended up meeting Sylvain Marconnet, Pierre Rabadan. Um, and so I think Paris has him now, mate, if I'm honest. I haven't. <laughs> I've had a couple of WhatsApps, but I'm sure he had a very, very good night. I got to bed about two, and I think he didn't have anything to do the next day, so he'd have had a very, very big night. And let's just briefly touch on that game in Paris on Saturday night before yeah. we bring Benji's replacement in and upgrade. <laughs> have a chat a bit more, in a bit more depth about it, because you were there and you mentioned the fans. Back. Yeah. So just talk us through the atmosphere. Was it? Did it feel special? Really special. Um, and just the the general feeling so around the place so the buzz walking up to the stadium you could just feel there was sort of tension in the air because fans haven't had it they haven't been there in those numbers and droves and they've started little by little sport their clubs but in terms of countries we, we haven't had it um so it's that big feeling of big day out getting your first beer with mates walking to the national stadium supporting your team anthems and, and so weirdly the sort of compare and contrast but Stade de France when the sort of team sheet was getting you know named when it was getting called out and the, the different names were coming up the absolute house okay like for Antoine Dupont the ovation the man got like it's like Lionel Messi he is absolutely loved so people are so happy to be back in stadiums back watching their national sport back supporting their teams and you could see as well the reaction of players when they were getting clapped into stadiums when the anthems were going there were tears smiles absolutely loving it during a warm-up there's something tangible now and there's something in the air that players have missed for two years and it's amazing for them to to get it back so for both sides so for supporters and for the players for staff for, for stupid people like commentary like the lift it gives you when you're going through um it can't be replaced and it's been a little bit soulless over the past couple of years so it was just really very cool to to have that back have that feeling back and to be back in national stadiums with your mates have a beer and enjoy the rugby at the weekend you mentioned Dupont all the talk in the build-up was about yeah. his captaincy and then about his combination with Matthew Jalibert. So on both fronts, yeah. a diff difficult game for him, but how did he um, go in the, in the captaincy? In, look, in, in strictly in the captaincy, fine. Um, he's a really calm, cool, collected individual. He's not somebody who's going to fall out with a referee. He manages things well. He calls well. Um, the game didn't really flow. Um, so in terms of individual brilliance, we didn't see super Anton Dupont, but we saw in fits and starts how he can break the game apart by himself, create something from nothing, which he always does. And he created loads of half chances um, and he was involved in some of their best plays. So the player, absolutely no question. The captaincy, absolutely fine. He's going to get better with time as well. Uh, so pass marks. I think the sort of main talking point was the 10-12 combination or Jali Tamak, as it's been dubbed by the French is press, okay. which is horrible. <laughs> Jali Tamak. Um, and just how they, they didn't really get to click. They didn't really get any time on the ball. Um, I actually really enjoyed some of Mario Ledesma's strategic choices. So they opted to keep the ball on the field. They didn't kick out at all. 
Fabian Galtier, obviously one of his strengths from my time with him is attack, starter plays. He can completely carve things up. But when you take that away, you just give France unstructured play. And when you chuck in a 10-12 a combo that hasn't played together, it's hard to settle. There's, there's no launch, there's no strike plays. It's in multi-phase of scrappy ball. So really, it was hard. It was hard for them. There wasn't any rhythm to the game. They also blitzed them in defence, came up and cut down all the other time and space. So they didn't really look settled. Um I think from the training pictures from what we've seen of training this week, it looks like they're going to start them again together, yeah. which is interesting. Um, I thought that might be a once and chucked out, but obviously they'll be given more time in the ball, more space, and they'll click, hopefully, uh, much more efficiently against Georgia. So it looks like that's with one eye to go and play against the All Blacks without getting any players back. That's your 10-12 combination, your 9-10-12 axis that you're going to go with through the three tests. So um, that was the main talking point. That was what everyone was looking forward to seeing um, probably the most, but it didn't quite spark or light up, I think, the way the coaches were um, were hoping for. Um, but they get another run at it this week. Well, it's about time we got Benji's replacement on now, then his upgrade, as we're calling it. And you're basically French now, Johnny, an adopted Frenchman. So in the interest of balance, we thought we'd get an Argentinian on instead of a Frenchman to talk about that France-Pumas game. So former Argentina fullback and one of the best ever Argentinian imports to the top 14. Martin Bustos Moyano joins us. How are you, Martin? Hi, team. How are you? It's nice to have you, mate, because you are an upgrade. You are also hot. You're half French as well, aren't you? You have yeah. your French passport. Yeah, exactly. So you're half Argentinian, half French. I'm half Scottish, half French. Um, well, nine... I'm, I'm, I have a, I'm German as well. Oh, I wow. forgot about that. Yeah. No, but it's good to have you. You'd also refer to yourself as a nine out of 10 on a bad day and Benji Kayser is probably a six and a half out of ten so it's good to yeah, have you as I said, said before I'm a nine and a half you made me impressed <laughs> exactly on a good day with the wind behind you and that monobrow <laughs> shaved in um, <laughs> mate more generally and we've seen this so much so France Argentina are always classics and RG yeah. seem to always raise their game and do really well there's been some massive shocks at World Cups there's been some great results for you in autumn fixtures as well what is it about playing against the French national team that you guys absolutely love? Is it the similarity in temperament and mentality? Is it the fact that half you play here in the top 14? What is it exactly that gets you so up for these games? Because they're so good to watch. I think that the game, but actually the, the games between France and Argentina became really important for us, at least. After the World Cup, whether we beat them twice. Yeah. So after that World Cup, it becomes like uh, we came like the All Blacks for France because we beat them after like I don't know five six games in a row, and uh, I think as well that the fact that a lot of players play used to play here in France, how now you have a lot of Argentina as well, but uh, I think was as well as a derby between teammates or trying to 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 challenge your, your teammates or even the players you play in other teams. And where are they at, at the moment generally? Obviously, we saw them at the weekend and, and it was a very close game, but we're sort of halfway in between World Cups at the moment and obviously under Mario Ledesma, who you know well. Um, so where do you think the Pumas are at right now? I think uh, Argentina is through a big transi transition because there are a lot of young players, even players that play in the first international games. So I think that we are struggling at the moment. I mean, in terms of results, because the the rugby they show a couple of years in the four nation it's quite different from what we are showing now. And it's because you know the the former captain uh, Agustin Craig is not playing anymore. You got Sanchez that used to be in uh, the the fly half that team now he's on the bench or sometimes he's not even playing. And um, I think it's, a, as I said, it's a trans transition between old and young players. And I hope they're going to do it. Well, I think they're going to do good in the, in the World Cup. I don't know if they're going to be the team that uh, to beat, but it might be the, a little surprise. Can you give us a little insight into Mario Moore's man? Because obviously his first coaching role was when we were together at Montpellier. Um, but you played with him. He was part your captain as part of the Puma setup. You played a few tests with him. What was he like in, as a player and as, as a bloke when you were around the same squad together? 
Well, I played with him with Ross at the end of his career. He was, I would say, quite tired. <laughs> <laughs> his level was not the same as he used to show in the, the beginnings of his year in France. So I think he was more in the, in the movement because of his name that his his real quality in that time. But uh, no, he's a good guy. Good guy as a as a as a, as a team. It's it's a, it's a good guy. It's a good a good cut time. Uh, has, I have a, him as a, as a coach as well, but not not me. I think you can say a little bit more, John, because yeah. your your coach, not mine. Yeah, no, he was decent. That's the, that's why I asked, just because technically he was decent and and really young as well, new to it. And I was kind of surprised, not shocked, but I I really enjoyed some of the choices they made on the on the field at the weekend. So like leaving the ball on the field, making it hard for France. Obviously, he knows Fabian so well. Like he started off his career together. He, he they, they knew each other inside out. So they kind of cancelled out certain elements of the game as coaches, which I find really interesting to to watch as the game went on. And then, obviously, the guy I just mentioned, but Fabian Galtier, now the French coach, he was he was a consultant for Argentina when you were part of the Argentinian setup, and it was him that took you and me. So I've always had like a I was going to say a thing for Fabian. That's a bit weird, but there's always a. <laughs> It's really cool that he he brought us over. I feel really fortunate that he gave me a chance in France, playing for Montpellier, like big, beautiful city, great club to play in. Um, and it must be the same for you. Um, so like, how how would you regard Fabian in terms of the coach that you had? Obviously, as a young man, he's developed a lot now, but he's still the best attack coach I ever played with. He got the best out of me, rugby-wise, that any coach got the best out of. Yeah, yeah I can agree more with you. I think it was one of the best coaches I had. He, as you said, he made me come to France. Uh, he was a assistant coach in the national squad, and they were, I met him there. We play a game against Scotland in Murrayfield. It was my first cup. I think you lost that one, mate. Yeah, so were you playing, Johnny? Uh, I think we lost. Yeah, I think we lost. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But it was a it was a good party after, though. Yes. I like that. <laughs> and uh, yeah, as you said, it's like. A great coach, great tactical, tactical coach, technical coach. But uh, apart from that, and you know, human, hu- the human part of Fabian is quite complicated because being with Fabian is quite like intense. And in terms of, I said, uh, the human, his human part is not that sensible. Yeah, we've had this chat before, haven't we, Johnny? That <laughs> everyone has said that he's that's why he's so suited to international rugby yeah. because. Short bursts. Yeah. So is that that what you're saying, Martin? Yeah, that's what I mean. That's what I mean. I, I think that being with players uh, just two or three weeks more than enough. Because, as I said, he's a great, great coach. He he tells you what is going to happen in the game. Everything happens exactly as he says. He gives everything for you to find a solution for that situation during the game. So, it, in terms of coaches, he's amazing. That's right. His rugby IQ and like giving you the keys into how to unlock a game yep. is unbelievable. And and that was the coolest bits on number eight was that you knew exactly where to go to get your touches on the ball, how to affect the game, how to break the game down and effect, effectively be effective as a team, um, which I hadn't had before to that level. But like you said, a little bit complicated sometimes, but at the same time, I remember having the conversation with you, with Francois Tranduc, with Mamuka Gorgodze and saying, if this guy ever gets hold of the French national team, they're yeah. going to be insanely good. Um, and that's what they have now. That's what's exciting. Um, and so for you and me, when we first signed together, like you were part of a wave of, there was Juan Figalo, Chippy Figalo, there was uh, Santi, Santi Fernandez, Fernandez, Lucas Amorosino, Augustin Crevy. Like there was a whole raft of Argentinians came over. Yeah. And that was probably the most I ever enjoyed my rugby because the squad was so diverse. You had Argentinians, you had Georgians, Fijians, one Scottish guy representing the UK, Shantaine Happy, Anthony Tuatavaki, Renny Ranger, like the squad was just insane. And, a and the rugby, Frenchies. and a few Frenchies, the, the sort of underbelly was Frenchies. Um, and that was it. You just played fantastic rugby every weekend. You, you lived in a beautiful part of the world. It was just amazing. Um, and so that was kind of the experience that Fabian gave both of us. So it must have been really cool for you to come over with half the Argentinian squad, settle in Montpellier and make it home. Was yeah, that all was- Fabian as well? There was the recruitment to bring you both in there. Yeah. It was all Fabian. Yeah, so Fabian at that time, so obviously he'd worked with the Argentinian team, but he was also part of his contract was that he could be, he was the France, the France TV um, commentator. So he'd watch all the international rugby games and that's where he would just like cherry pick 
players that he enjoyed watching, players that, because he's got a good eye, maybe not with me, but he's got a good eye for talent and he, that's it. He would just pick people that he enjoyed watching or thought could add something different to the team in Montpellier. Um, and that was the team that he assembled. So he did recruitment, he did the attack, he was the head coach and it was 100%. He did everything. He did everything. And 100%, it was the best rugby experience I had. And I think it was probably the same in pure rugby terms. It was probably the same for you, Martin. Yeah, sense? It was, yeah, it makes sense. I agree. I agree with you because... It was really, really good. I mean, uh, as I said, uh, in terms of on the field, it was it was really uh, in all the details. It was and and I think with him, I started learning how to watch a game, not just as a fan, it's not that uh, analyze, analyze the analyze the games because he gave us different situations along the week to prepare the game, and that was the first time somebody. Offers me that, too. and and I think I evolved a lot with him as a, as a player. We'll come back to international rugby as well in a bit, but obviously the two of you are teammates, so we can't get you on without asking you a bit about Johnny and playing with him at two different clubs. So you play with him at Montpellier, and then you moved on to Bayonne. A few years later, Johnny rocks up again, so you couldn't shake him off, could you? <laughs> he was following me. Who eh? <laughs> was after me? Yeah, well, have a, we, I arrived one year before joining to Montpellier, so I prepared all this, everything for him. And we had a really good time. Red carpet, in, in it was rolled out. The red yeah. carpet yeah. was rolled out. The, 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 star of, the, the Scottish star was arriving, so we prepared everything for him. Now we had a really good time there, really. At the beginning, well, we, we met in Montpellier without kids, and then we came here to the combat country, two kids, no life. <laughs> <laughs> that's the important but we had fun in Montpellier we didn't that was yeah. it but it was just Francois Tranduc owned his own bar there so every time we'd be there after games with everybody really social and again no, it, it was good. mainly young yeah. couples so it was very cool especially for first experience in France yeah. um, extremely like, social as you, said, as you said it was a really good time on the field and outside the field yeah which made the difference it just meant that and weirdly it might have been different for you Martin but for me coming from Glasgow and the west coast of Scotland to coming to Montpellier. Like I remember, I remember on like the fifth day of preseason, Fabian was like, ah, let's go down the beach and just like cancel the fifth day of preseason. I was thinking we're going to get slaughtered, cancelled it all, took us down to the beach, took us down to the port actually. And he was like, come on, we're going to speak to the fishermen. We went down and like they set out tables. We found their oyster catch. We were opening oysters, having champagne on the fifth day of preseason. I thought, if this is what professional rugby is like, I, I don't remember in the middle of winter going to ski. Yeah, King, they would take right? us up to, I can't remember, what was it King. up in um, San Larry? Maybe they took us up to the the stadium, the ski resort, where they have the Fabian Galtier Stadium. It's named after him. Yeah. Um, and there would be like one or two days of activity, which would be climbing up a mountain in the snow, but that'd be followed by three or four days of team bonding, barbecues, um, and just a fun time. So it was an incredible first experience um, in France and really cool that we got to do it together with such an eclectic yeah. mix of nationalities, personalities, um, it was a really cool dynamic. So that was Montpellier, and then Bayonne. Johnny, essentially, Martin is responsible for your next contract. You were. Yeah, I'm still waiting for the tea. Eh? Then I get to the bank account. <laughs> the commission. It's on. Normally, it's the it's the clubs that pay the agents and the commissions fee mates. You might be waiting. I'm not sure if Bayonne's sneaky that way, but the checks in the post. That's what they said. <laughs> Do you remember how it happened? Uh, I remember after the we won against Oriac, who we in the in the locals. I was having a talk with the with the coach. You text me like saying good luck or congratulations. Can can we remember? And I said, what about if we make we bring Johnny to, to Bayon next year? And the coach looked at me and said, oh, that's a good idea. That that is yours, huh? I got, I got it, the idea of Johnny, the, the young Johnny, strong Johnny, Johnny from Montpellier. <laughs> and you got a slightly, slightly, slightly beaten up older version. I, I can remember not really taking it seriously yeah. without causing offense. I can remember sending a message yeah, to you because obviously true. we're mates and had a really good time on Pelly, just sending you well and, and wishing you well for the final against Oriac. But it must have been three or four hours yeah. before kickoff and you writing back and saying, oh, I'm sitting with Achetto, with Vincent Achetto, who's the coach. And he says, if we win, 
you're going to come, you're going to sign for us. And I was like, oh, I've still got an extra year in my contract to cast. Like, I don't know if that'll happen. And then you won the game and I sent you saying, enjoy the party, enjoy the celebrations. And then another text, about, <laughs> I'm still with Aceto. And now he's serious. Like, he's going to send you an offer in the next 10 days. And that was it. it happened really quickly. And I had just yeah, had my first, I just had Lockie in that summer 2016. So complete change, complete swivel, packed up, moved the house. I think Jen had given birth like two and a half weeks earlier. So she actually really enjoyed that move. That was great fun. But I can remember as well for you, that all going so quickly for me, but I can remember for you, you'd had Martina, your first daughter, essentially straight after that win. So you didn't even get to enjoy the celebrations of the first time you got by on from body to up to top 14. You had to go straight to the hospital, didn't you? Actually, the day before, coaching my wife, she went to the hospital. I had to stay at the hospital and the president took me from the hospital to the stadium. So coach was already in the hospital. I played the game and straight away I came back. You didn't quite get the helicopter like Joe Marler. It was a little bit different because it was 2016. <laughs> uh, it wasn't the same budget, I think. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it was, it was as, as easy as you said. Eh? Uh, the I came to say yes, it just it's how it was with, with Johnny. Um, why not make him come here to, to Basque country? Uh, here we are, a eh? couple of years later. Not Still only on two kids. Not only are you responsible for getting Johnny a, a bumper contract, but you're also responsible for his way of life. He's staying there for life in the, the south of France. He could have been back in Scotland now. Yeah. You know, one of the things that uh, Galtier told me the, when the, the day I told him I was leaving, he said, remember, you want to stay there in the Basque country. You want to, want to live there. And a couple of years later, I'm here still here. <laughs> Leaving my kids for one year, I have a house, my wife. You, you've got all, here. you've got all of that. And is there a, a statue of you on the way as well? Because you, Johnny mentioned you getting them promotion. Then you've done it twice. You've got them promoted twice back up to the top fourteen. So, are you a hero in in Bayonne? Is there a statue coming? No, <laughs> no, no. He's exactly right in a, a little bit. No, no, no. I got lucky twice. That's it. <laughs> Johnny, Johnny, he's very modest, but you can tell us. Um, I mean, yes and no. I think there is a statue and there is a monument in the supporters' heads. I think for both of us, it kind of finished at the wrong moment. It was bittersweet. So it was it was effectively our last game. The, the pair of us played our last games together after that journey started in Montpellier for the club. But ultimately, we were kind of pushed, if, if that's the fair way to say it. So I think in the supporters' eyes... They will never, ever forget what Martin did for the club to bring them up from Pro De Do, which is an absolute marathon, a slog, not an easy competition to get out of. To do that not only once, but twice. Once by kicking Oriac to death, and then the second time by beating Breve in stoppage time with the last kick of the game. Um, there won't be many people, um, and that's Frenchmen included, that are held in as high regard as Martin is by the pay Basque population, by Bayonne supporters, um, and the boys that he played with in general as well. So I don't think there's a statue for, for other reasons. There might be a stand yeah. named after you. There might be a stand named after you in a couple of years' time. Um, but no, I don't think there's a statue in the car park just yet. But there might be something in the pipeline, <laughs> maybe when the president changes in a few years' time. That, um, that second promotion, that, getting them promoted, that turned out to be your last kick in professional rugby, didn't it? So... At the time, there was headlines everywhere about the fact that, and I think they were true, the fact that you they stopped picking you in the second half of the season because you had a clause in your contract about it being automatically renewed if you played a certain amount of games. But then you get to the playoffs and they bring you back in, you kick them to promotion and then out again. Yeah, that's quite the, the story. Yeah. Actually, it was that way. Uh, in December, the coach called me and told me uh, I was, wasn't playing anymore because they realized that there was a new person. The new person realized that I had a contract. But if I keep on playing and I reach 15 games, I have one more year. There was an old contract I signed with the other person. Uh, he didn't know about it, apparently. So they say even you, you say no to that clause and you, you play, 
So you stay outside the field. So I stay outside the field for two or three months till I said, okay, stop. I will be the one that to decide where if I keep on playing or not, not the club. So I said, okay. I don't, I don't mind. I will say no to the clause and I will I will be available for, for the coach. And that was the way it was. It's a shame, but uh, at least uh, I finish rugby the way I want on the field and outside the field. I, I take that and I stay with that. That's the way I want to remember things. And you mentioned the first promotion. You had to rush straight back to hospital. So that second one, the last game of your professional career, did you manage to celebrate that? Tell me you did. Yeah, yeah, we did. We did. We did, we did with Johnny, we, we, the whole team. Yeah, I, I think was I was a a good way of. Well, you can ask Johnny what happened with him at the game. I was, I was, gonna, I was going to ask you. Obviously, I got left by the <laughs> by the staff manager who left me in the stadium because Paul for Namibian number eight was taking a piss and doing his drug testing, so they forgot about us because they were so keen to get back to buy on and get on it and enjoy the party. So they forgot about me. So I was going to ask you, how was the bus trip? Did you enjoy it? <laughs> I hope it was worth it. I enjoyed how did you, it, yeah. how did you, you enjoyed that bit probably the most. I know, I know you did. Um, but the, the <laughs> celebrations afterwards were amazing, even though it finished on a, on a strange note. It was, it was so good to finish with the players, with the staff, and with thousands of supporters in Bayonne. Yeah, you were again, you were up on the, you were the, you were the balcony in the Mary. Um, kissing babies and switching on the Christmas lights and the hero of the town. Um, so you absolutely <laughs> loved it. But it was, it was just an amazing way to finish, even though it wasn't exactly easy for either of us during the year. Um, it was a very cool way to finish together in the end. Yeah, it was a really long year. It was a very good way to finish it. Martin, it doesn't say a lot for poor old Johnny that not only the, the the team manager, but all of his teammates were like, ah, it's fine. We'll just leave him there. It's fine. <laughs> or he didn't even notice that he wasn't on the bus. I, did, I didn't know Johnny wasn't on the bus. <laughs> no, I didn't, didn't notice, really. I'm not going to lie to you. Johnny? No, I don't, I don't I, judge I don't you, mate. I, I wouldn't have noticed either. Mate, you were having the time of your life. I think there was four of us. I think there was Poff, our Namibian number eight who's a character. There was Tristan Tedder, a young South African boy, and there was Torsten van Jarsvelt, the Namibian hooker as well. Yeah. <laughs> we, and that was it. There was four of us. It wasn't like it was just me. I'm not, I'm not going to cry. Um, and we actually got a police escort, which went about 200 kilometers an hour back to Bayonne to try and reunite us with everyone and get into the party. So man, it was a good story. <laughs> it, was, it was ridiculous at the time. It's still ridiculous now with hindsight, but um I oh, mean, it's just part of the story. It was great. Good memory. Hilarious now looking back. Um, and a nice way to end, as I mentioned. It was cool. Just to right. myself, I was with my family. So I jumped onto the bus at the last moment. That's why I didn't realize. It wasn't there. And how long is the journey back? How long was the bus journey? No, just, just one hour, hour and a half maximum. That's right. just an hour and a half you were only missed for an hour and a half if it had been three hours Johnny, they'd have noticed. just the head count just the head count <laughs> is all we're asking <laughs> too much that right before we look ahead to the coming weekend it's about time we did our meter moment of the week isn't it johnny so do you want to talk us through it yep so the meter moment of the week martin you'll be joining us taking the place of benji kaiser um is essentially where we pick our favorite moment from rugby at the weekend so our meter moment okay. of rugby of the weekend. So I've got one and you've got one. Um, yep. It's not a competition. We could agree. We could disagree. Um, and I'll let you go first. So what have you got for us from okay. the weekend's games? What did you see and what's your meter moment of the weekend? For me, the meter moment of the week is the when all the supporters of the Scottish rugby were singing the Flowers of Scotland. Oh, he's good. Martin. He's, he's buttering you Martin. <laughs> Martin. Did you notice as well? I crossed by that with a video on, on Twitter. I, I was, it was really amazing. Eh? You were crying. You were crying. It's emotional. Almost, almost. Did you see that the French national anthem copied it as well? It's the second verse of the French national anthem was sung a cappella at the Stade de France. No. They'd, they'd never done that before, which I thought was really cool. I thought it was a little bit of a copy of the Flower of Scotland, but... It was very cool in the stadium. Um, very cool. Um, yeah, really? mate, that's I don't know. We'll see if mine's better. Um, but that's a good one. I'll take that one. My meter moment of the weekend was friend of the show, former guest, 
and his performance at the weekend, Thibaut Flamand. So, young man, four or five years ago in Loughborough first, not even first, Loughborough fifth 15, playing standoff, thinking, what am I doing here? Get me out of here. And at the weekend, general all-round performance, top tackler, first cap, and scores from about 30 metres in a try that he should never, ever stop talking about, which was absolutely ridiculous. So, did you, My, did you know that he played for the, he played in Argentina? Yeah, yeah, yeah he's, he's been on the show. His story is absolutely amazing and completely done it the hard way. And there won't be many people that do it like him now in the professional era. Really, really rare. And that's why even more so, this was my moment. Um, my meter moment is his performance, his first cap, his first try, top tackler, and basically an amazing weekend. It must have been ridiculous for him, for his family, and a way to celebrate. So that is my moment of the weekend by meter is the performance of Thibaut Flamand. This is tricky. I mean, surely it's got to go to Thibaut, but Martin's pulled on your heartstrings there, <laughs> Flower of Scotland. Yeah, Thibaut gets it for me. Absolutely, 100%. <laughs> Thibaut Flamand. Practical decision. Absolutely. We'll give it to Thibaut. Well, that was Johnny and Martin's meter moment of the week. And meter is the world's number one wireless meat thermometer. And they've made over 9 million cooks better with their revolutionary app as well. So it's no surprise they use it are growing rapidly every day. If you've ever said your pork or your turkey's dry, how's your cooking, Martin? How's your pork? How's your turkey? Better than Johnny's. No, it's not. He's Argentinian. He likes his steak well done. It's disgraceful. It's like leather. So he could do the meter, Martin. You need one for Christmas. For all Argentinians, this no, is what you need you have no to idea. do your steak properly. Don't touch me. You have no idea. <laughs> well, Martin, you can use it on a barbecue, in the oven, or in a pan. Yeah. We'll send you one over for Christmas. Yeah. Enter, a ho- enter a whole new world of cooking yeah. and join the metaverse at www.meter.com and just use the code FRENCHPOD10 at checkout for 10% off any full price item as well. Let's look ahead to this weekend then and France-Georgia in Bordeaux. So how good is it to see them playing outside of Paris, first of all? Very cool, Um, especially for a rugby hotbed that is the southwest of France. So everyone around here is going absolutely bananas and they're looking forward to driving up. You know, it's not a big flight up or a trek up to Paris it's a stadium that's near to this area of France the south of France is where I mean they really should move the national stadium down here to be honest Definitely. Um, and this is where the rugby population is and that's why everyone's pumped I know it's only a test against Georgia um, but very cool to see something slightly further south um, and a little bit of a point of difference for the French rugby fans they'll be really excited people might look at that game in between a test against Argentina and one coming up against the All Black and think they're going to rotate completely, but it doesn't look like it. And pictures no. coming out of training suggest that Matisse Labelle might get his chance on the wing in place of Gabon Villiers. But other than that, it looks like it's going to be the same back line, you know, the, the end to Max Jalibert combination yeah. again in the forwards. Rumours are Makalu is going to start, Aldrit is going to come in, Waki potentially playing second row because... Thibaut Flamon is, is injured, but, you know, not too many changes. Um, a little bit surprised then after the performance against Argentina, not surprised. So you want that access to settle and feel confident going to play against New Zealand. I initially thought like you, they would rotate, but then are you really going to rotate everyone, give them rest the week out before playing New Zealand? Not really. So look, it's the right choice. It didn't quite spark the way they wanted, although it was workman like the victory against Argentina, but the guys you mentioned there, I don't think there were many changes at all, if any. I think Greg Aldrich might come in as a possibility, but you mentioned Walkie moving up to second row. I think that's just because Thibaut's been out um, a, a little bit sore after his performance of the weekend. He'll probably slot straight back in um, because he was, for me, the man of the match uh, on the field. Um, and yeah, I don't see many changes at all. I think they look for consistency, try and build a little bit of momentum. And that 9, 10, 12 axis that we keep talking about, if that's going to be used to play against New Zealand, they need to go in with confidence. So they need another game under their belts to rack up some tries against Georgia. You probably hook these boys after 45, 50 minutes and wrap them in cotton wool after those minutes to start the biggest test that they've played together uh, as a 23. Yeah, we should say these are rumours coming out of training in the early part of the week. So it, yeah. it could be very different come the end of it, but it does look like they're going to stay fairly consistent, Martin. So is this... I think and I tomorrow. think it's a, it's a it's a way of, as well of playing playing against this kind of team that they never play with. 
against, you know. They never had a chance to play against Georgia, and it might be a team that we, they will face in, in the World Cup. So it's a hard team. They play hard. They're very good. Um, yeah, I think it's going to be a good experience for France. Even if they have the, if they are not, not changing a lot of players, and they have the, the match against the All Blacks after, but I think it's very useful as well to try new things, different kind of strategies. I don't know. You know, Galtis have some different systems, so he can change it to from one to another one. It's a way as, as well of evolving. And particularly the Entomac Jalibert combination, uh, whatever you called it earlier on, Johnny. And <laughs> I don't even remember. Jally, Jally, Jally Mac, Jally Mac. Jally Bear. I don't know what I called it. Surely, surely Enter Bear is better than Jally Mac, isn't it? But anyway, whatever they want to call it. But that that is something that you know you you know more than Johnny Martin. That, that in the in the backs you need to work on those combinations, don't you? You can't just play it in not great conditions against a tough Argentina team and then you know rest them and then bring him back against the All Blacks. They need this game, don't they? And they need to to work on that combination. Oh, definitely. They, they need to work in small details. They sometimes are, are more important. And uh, I think if you, as long as he plays a lot of games, you're going to help him get uh, in, the, in good shape with the other players. So it's, it's important as well to have a, a well, at least for me, I prefer have, playing with two tens, like Charlie Bird and Mutamak. Um, I think uh, if he plays against Georgia, he won't play him against New Zealand. Who? Well, he won't play against New Zealand? Charlie Bird. Hmm. See, I think the other way. I think if you're going to play them again together, Jali Tamak, I've got it back <laughs> in my head now. <laughs> if you're going to play them together, is because you want to string them together and get them used to doing something before they play against you. I think if you play them together in this test match, it's to build confidence and so they can go at it because they don't really have any other players, mate. That's the other thing. With the injuries they've got, the only other option is Jonathan Dante. Um, so yeah, yeah I think, that's true, but I think he's going to try something different against the All Blacks. You think, you think Fabian will show a different hand? Yeah. He's not going to, he's not going to show the same hand three games in a row. Uh, I'm trying to think of Fabian. Yeah, you know Fabian very well, so you think he's going to spring a surprise. He doesn't want to show his hand to the All Blacks, and then he's going to... No, he, he, he has always a, a surprise. He's always trying to surprise the, the team, so I don't know. We'll see, but I, I think he's going to play Jolly and Tamak this week, but not, the, not against the Blacks. Interesting. Well, we will get your predictions in for this weekend shortly, but just before we do, there's been a bit of transfer gossip in the top 14 as there usually is, every week. And a lot of it centres around Bordeaux, where this weekend's game is. So what's been going on with Bordeaux, Johnny? Moving chess pieces. There's a coach moving on, is there not, Martin? That was announced in the press here. Our old yep, coach, that's it. Yannick Brew, looks like he's moving on. Um, so he's now not in charge of the recruitment process or anything that's happening in Bayonne for next season. Um, not quite sure where he's going to end up, but rumoured that potentially Montpellier, potentially Lyon, and now Bayonne are looking for replacements for next season. And when that happens, it's sort potentially of... Potentially racing. Potentially to racing as well. And when that happens, it kind of knocks as like a chain reaction of dominoes that things start knocking into place and, and contracts start getting gobbled up. So you've got Ugo Boniface, who's a sort of young loose head that we played with Martin, who potentially could pay, play for France long-term as well. Um, really good Fitness loose head. Coach as well, leaving. Yeah, there's, there's a few guys leaving. So Ugo looks like he's maybe moving up the road to Bordeaux. Uh, Thierry... Payava, who's in the French extended squad, but not in this camp, um, looking at moving to La Rochelle. You then at Bordeaux, I, again, it's a sort of tip of the cap to Urios because things are going so well. Some of the players are really shining. So Satini potentially moving on. You've got Ben Lam, who's been exceptional so far. Again, linked with um, Montpellier. And then like as these chess pieces move, Things fall into place for loads of different players. So you've got Teddy Bobigny, who's been out of contract to Racing 92. He's potentially moving that to Toulon. You've also got Swan Rabash, who just re-signed four years at Toulon. So it's the time of year where everything is happening and all the contracts are getting signed. And it's a happy time for everyone if you've got yeah. something secured. Uh, a little bit difficult for those coming towards the end of their career, like Martin and I. Um, but it is what it is. It's <laughs> non-stop. 
and every week something's happening in top 14 at the minute. Well, let's finish off by getting your predictions in for the Autumn Nation series then. And the Guinness Pint predictor on Match Pint is back. So anyone listening can join in and prove they know far more about the game than so-called experts like Johnny, Benji, <laughs> Martin. <laughs> it's really simple. You just download the Match Pint app, predict the scores, beat your mates and win pints of Guinness. And to compete against Johnny and Benji and Martin. All you need to do is enter our private league with the code Low Rugby, and the overall winner of that will get a very special prize at the end too. So, Martin, you're our special guest and our former Puma, so I'll ask you first, Italy, Argentina, what's happening at the weekend? I think uh, Argentina is going to beat Italy for 15 points. Johnny? Pff, very similar. I've got Italy 19, Argentina 27. Wales, Fiji, Johnny? I am going to go Wales 36, Fiji 13. Again, I don't know the prep that Fiji have had. I don't know where they were last week. I don't know what squad they have assembled, but it's never easy for them at the end of year tour. So Wales 36, Fiji 13. Yeah, I see Wales, Wales as well for 22 points. But you never know with the Fijians, eh? Playing Fijians no. are dangerous. Absolutely. Um... Come to you first, Martin, because Johnny's biased on this one. Scotland, South Africa. I'll say South Africa. <laughs> by t- 10 points. <laughs> oh, Martin. You had me <laughs> with the anthem earlier, and now you've gone back into your pocket. Um, I'm being really so, sorry. <laughs> so, I thought Scotland were actually very good last weekend at the bits that you have to be good at to beat South Africa. So the set piece was good. Line out was good. I also found out the South African boys were out in the piss on the Wednesday night before the Welsh test until six in the morning. So sort of questioning where their heads are at. Um, South Africa have also already picked Willie LaRue back in, who doesn't enjoy a high ball. Elton Janchi's at 10. He's talking yeah. out, Martin. This is only you going I, one way. <laughs> and I'm just thinking, if you're going to knock the World Cup winners over after a British Lions tour, couldn't do it. And you've got Finn Russell and you've got an attack-minded coach in Gregor Townsend. I don't know. I've got a little, little sneaky feeling. I might be very, very wrong, but I'm going to go Scotland 24, South Africa 22, margin of two points and a little win for Scotland, which would be really cool. England, Australia, Johnny. You're on a roll now. Who's winning that? Uh, England by eight points. Um, hopefully Marcus Smith starting. Eddie Jones just picking his best players. Maybe Don Brandt will get a run and he'll do things right. Um, but England have got a lot of quality. Australia kind of tripped up in a few areas in that game against Scotland. So I think England by eight, 28-20. I will pick Australia. Four Ooh. points. I feel like, uh, they got a good team. They're going to be the... I don't like England, sorry. <laughs> uh, never did. Ireland, New Zealand, my team. Uh, would be definitely a Kiwi. Then great big, shape. Big great margin, team. little margin? I would say a little margin. Five points. Five, six points. I've gone a bit bigger. I thought Ireland were really impressive last weekend against Japan. I didn't see that result coming against Japan. That was crazy. Um, but New Zealand are just on a bit of another planet this year. So I'm going to go New Zealand by 11, 29, 18 to New Zealand. And the big one, France, Georgia. Jali Tamak. <laughs> Jali Tamak to come together. I don't think Georgia will. Like They'll be competitive at scrum time and they'll be scrappy at malls. But I just think overall, France has got way too much quality, too well coached, too well organised. Um, I am going to go 50 points to nine for France. I will agree with Johnny this time, but I think it's going to be a 20 points difference between them. Thanks, Johnny. A big thanks to Martin for filling Benji's boots and doing it even better. We might have you on next week, Martin. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks very much. I'm still struggling with my English. Eh? Quite rusty, as I told you. Not at all. Thank you very much. Oh, mate. I have a really You're good time. You're flying. You're absolutely flying. And you're a much more attractive version than Benji Jesus. <laughs> so kind of you. 
a big thanks to both of you. We'll see if Benji returns next week or not. Thanks to everyone out there for listening as well. Make sure you hit subscribe. Leave us a nice review if you can as well. Check us out on Rugby Pass and on YouTube. And we'll be back with another episode next week. Au revoir, guys. Cheers, Bye. Tim. Good Thanks, night. Martin. Bonne nuit. Bye.